Welcome to New Dentists on the Block, a podcast featuring new dentists sharing their experiences in the world of dentistry, successes, challenges, and life in between, navigating dentistry together one experience at a time. I'm so excited to have Dr. Abby Halpern join us for this episode. Dr. Abby Halpern is a general dentist that practices in Old Town, Alexandria, right outside of Washington, D.C. Born and raised in Marietta, Georgia by a periodontist and a dental assistant, dentistry didn't always seem like the obvious choice for her. It was through her exposure to organized dentistry and advocacy that Abby found her passion for the profession and patients. While in dental school, she balanced her studies with involvement in the American Student Dental Association, and she served as my Speaker of the House and Chair of the Council of Advocacy. After dental school, she completed a GBR at the Washington, D.C. VA Medical Center. She now serves as the Speaker of the House of the Virginia Dental Association and is an alternate delegate to the ADA. When they aren't enjoying football Sundays on their couch with their cat, Mookie, she and her husband, Andy, continue to occupy themselves exploring all that the city has to offer in food, fun, and adventure. Abby and I shared many great memories in Asda, and I'm so excited for you to take a listen to this episode. Let's get to it. Abby Halpern, welcome to New Dentist on the Block. How are you doing today? I am doing so good and it's so lovely to see your face and hear your voice. It has been what feels like centuries really since Truly. you and I have been able to connect. Agreed on that. So this is a long time coming, but such a joyous part as we come into spring and just feel reinvigorated to see you. Oh, yes, absolutely. Abby, tell us uh, and our listeners a little bit about yourself. Great, great starting point here. Um, so the hardest I, question. Of the hard, I mean, truly, right? And you know, I'm long winded, but uh, I love it. I'm ready. From uh, Marietta, Georgia, I grew up there. Um, I have one older sister. She and I are super tight, and uh, went to University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Go heels. Um, and slowly made my way up the coast. I decided on dentistry kind of late. Um, and, uh, before that occurred, I actually came up to DC so close with my sister. I followed her kind of up here and came into this area that I just fell in love with. So although I went uh, back home to Georgia for dental school, I kind of made it my mission to get back up to the DMV as we call it. And that's where I live and play and practice now. So you have been around dentistry for a while pretty much all of your life because of your dad. Right. Did that influence you at all growing up, you know, searching for what profession you wanted to go into? Absolutely. I mean, I think I um, was very blessed in the sense that I I was kind of the world felt like my oyster. Um, and my parents did not push, push me in any one direction, which was great. But now that I look back on it, I'm like, you guys could have, you know, made this a little bit faster. I would have known this a little bit sooner. Um, but I was much more influenced by it than I realized. I kind of realized it later on growing up, I would be in my dad's office. He's a periodontist. He actually just retired in February, which is great. Um, but certainly influenced by being in the practice setting, just kind of knowing how it goes. That was very normal for me to be in a dentist office. I didn't have that fear growing up. That wasn't something that I didn't look forward to. Um, it also, from a young age, made me communicate with people that are in kind of a stressful situation and maybe not in their favorite place um, when I would be in the office setting and just hanging out. And honestly, when I started working there and call patients to confirm and greet them and even assist as well. Um, so it certainly influ influenced me, but it felt like I was looking at just about everything but dentistry when I was in college. Um, I was looking at being a radiology tech. Uh, a PA. And right before um, my senior year of college, I was on a road trip with my mom on the way down to Florida. And I was not a very emotional person then. And she asked me, she was like, Abby, why are you not considering dentistry? I think you'd be great at it for these reasons. And you know, why, why are you avoiding it basically? And I started crying at that point in time and was like, I just don't want to fail. I don't want to be bad at anything, but certainly bad at something that I hold in such a high regard because of my um, my dad's life in it that we had really built. Um, prior to that, I also, speaking of wild hairs that I was on, um, I was actually an archaeology and anthropology major in college. And I went on an excavation um, off the coast of Barcelona. 
and I was in charge of this uh, 3rd century BC Roman burial site, or not fully in charge, but in charge of using a pickaxe in there and precious, in charge of uh, getting to it, getting to what was inside. And we, you know, uncovered this woman's um, skull and her teeth were beautiful. They look better than anything. I mean, what you would often see today. And I remember kind of having a realization, having that go through my head, looking at her teeth, but probably looking at them in a different way than many people would and reflecting on, oh, okay, these are interesting to me. And I have learned a lot in my dad's office. Um, So kind of those things together, I came to a realization like, you know what, I'm going to pursue this. We're going to see what happens. Can't hurt to try kind of thing. Um, And lo and behold, I didn't get into dental school the first time I applied. So all of that fear of failure in a way came to fruition. But at that point, it wasn't so scary to me because I knew that's what I wanted to do. Um, And ultimately, is that really failure? No, it, it showed me how much more I wanted it. Although it was annoying to have a year in a way, and at that time it was probably bitter. Um, It was a great thing. And and to go off what I was saying about following my sister up to the DC area, I moved up here because I had that time that I knew I needed to reapply. And um, I did a master's at Georgetown, fell in love with that campus and again, this area. Um, And then she was working um, at the American Dental Association's DC office. So I'd go meet her every so often for lunch. One of her colleagues needed an intern, and I was like, you know, I could I could help out with that. Um, and that also opened my eyes and then again influenced me in terms of why I wanted to pursue dentistry, not just in the clinical setting, but beyond that and how it can really affect people across the board and how you know little changes have such a ripple effect. Again, my dad and, and mom have influenced me in how much they had invested in the, this profession and all the organized dentistry that my dad was involved in and going on these trips, that was normal to me. And I thought every dentist did that. Mm -hmm. Um, And while I was interning, I realized, no, you have to make such a concerted effort to spend that time, money and effort um, to, to make those changes and be a part of this and serve your profession, but your patients beyond the operatory. Um, So I really value what my parents instilled in me, instilled in me at a young age without me really realizing it. Yeah, I, I have two great thoughts here. And the first one is, if you haven't listened to Amrita Patel's episode that I have, she talks a little bit how, about how she wanted to be an Egyptologist mm. and then made her way into dentistry also because of, you know, influences from her youth. Her father's in dentistry as well, too. And I just feel like I made that connection right now when you were talking a little bit about your, your past. And I think that that's just so cool. Um, and the other thought is, uh, I love you know, the opportunity that you had to intern in DC. And I can only imagine how much it's shaped you now. For me, my perspective of you is also, uh, you know, obviously I, I respect you so much and um, like. you're a colleague, you're a friend, you're somebody that I look up to. But one of the things that has always stood out to me is just your involvement and um, how passionate you are about the political side of the world, but also of dentistry. And I feel that, and correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of that came from that internship that you yeah, took part of. Definitely. Um, and for me, it was interesting because, so my sister is in the political sphere and shout out to Natalie. Um, she is actually now a lobbyist for the American Dental Association. So, so cool. It, so I think cool. it's super cool. Some people probably think it's weird, but like, that's awesome. Um, and we've somehow both ended up in this profession that neither one of us planned on. Um, but with her, I mean, she always kind of gravitated towards that. We also thought she was going to be a lawyer, all these things that she was very political minded. And I never was. And I am a super non-confrontational person. I avoid politics as much as possible, like the plague. Um, But I think I found then what I felt comfortable advocating for by way of dentistry, kind of in a backwards way. I wasn't the type that was, you know, already politically inclined and then came into the profession and it evolved from there. It was more so I was so interested in it that I kind of felt that I had to be an advocate. Um, So with that internship, I, again, got to see that you have to make that concerted effort and that it's not something you do once a year, but it's building relationships. And I know, you know, Rupali is a dear friend as well. And that's a big thing for her, a big thing for you. And a big thing why many of us go into the profession of dentistry is because it is at its core 
building relationships with people, making them more comfortable, and then delivering optimum healthcare to them. Um, so I think that I, I, again, recognized how things that I would gravitate towards dentistry for because of those reasons also made me gravitate towards being um, an advocate. And I feel like I was super involved in that advocacy um, during dental school. And I'm so glad that I that I did. And I had such a pulse on what was going on. And being a new, new dentist, a little bit of that I've lost in some ways, but I've become an advocate in in other ways, I think, too. Um, and I'm looking to, you know, just like many things with COVID, things got quieter uh, in terms mm-hmm. of your ability to even yeah. meet with people. And um, I'm just feeling really reinvigorated to get involved in the uh, advocacy side again. Um, not that I haven't been, but for me, I haven't, you know, I, I've been a lesser point than what I had been before. Yeah. You know, we ran with so much energy during our time in ASDA. And like uh, Abby mentioned, she was involved in uh, the advocacy section through ASDA. And she was also the Speaker of the House, a phenomenal Speaker of the House, mm-hmm. if I might add. Uh, but I, I cannot wait until, you know, we're, we're back to where that momentum was. Yeah. And you're already shining, but you're going to continue to shine in that realm as well, too. Likewise. Likewise. I, uh, I so with, you know, what Tanya Sue is, is saying here is I hit the ground running before dental school and knew a little bit of what was going on. And then in dental school, it was like, Oh, American student dental association. Perfect. Organized dentistry. This is what I want to do. Want to be involved um, with it from the get go and use that uh, advocacy um, as, as my way of involvement and loved my time there. And um, I think it, when I was reflecting on our time in ASDA and how that again evolved over time, we didn't really know each other until later in dental school. That's when we got to spend more time with each other mm-hmm. because of our time on the board. And when I was moving from being on that legislative side, um, that advocacy side to the speaker side, I kind of saw it as I've so outwardly been involved in advocacy and now I'm taking it a bit more insular to the association, ensuring that people are able to advocate for themselves on the house floor and throughout the year and make their voices heard so then those ripple effects can can happen. So that became a more natural transition than I thought it would be. Ultimately, if I'm being honest with you and honest with myself, I think part of the reason I wanted to be speaker was I wanted to be involved with the board. Um, and that was, was one way that I thought I could really serve. Um, and I mean, being a part of that board was such an amazing experience. And I feel like that shaped my trajectory because again, had this experience with my family, with my parents and all that support and motivation to really get me, uh, starting with my wings. You talked, we had goose, uh, a shout out. <laughs> yes. goose's I, think, I think I still have that shirt. I got to go find it, it. It was, it was a thing, but so it kind of like had my wings and then like as to that board year just felt like got a lot of air under me and it now has transformed and giving me that confidence as a new dentist to continue to be involved. I know in some associations, it can be a little bit tougher when you're coming out um, and establishing yourself and then being recognized as someone who they want um, and value as a leader in your state association. I got really lucky with mine. um, And I'm I don't know if I've shared this with you. I'm now Speaker of the House for the VDA. Heck yeah. Uh, All right. So that gavel is is still being used. <laughs> um, so yeah, enjoying that and enjoying the opportunity that as a young and new dentist, they saw value in me. And I didn't know anybody really in the state of Virginia uh, before practicing here or anybody that had really ushered me um, in. And I so value that they were open to me. Um, so that's been a great way to still stay involved and I've enjoyed being, being speaker thus far. And thank you for, you know, your dedication to the profession. And for those who are listening, you know, mark my words, when Abby retires or or when, you know, our generation comes to where retirement should be, although we want that to be, you know, tomorrow, I will say that Abby and John Vogel will make their mark on the profession, but specifically in the realm of advocacy. They oh, are the advocacy king and queen in my book. Phenomenal people, phenomenal powerhouses. Uh, you are too kind. I put, I mean, like John Vogel, Sean Aiken, like they oh, yeah, are Sean doing Aiken it. Too, yes. they, they live and breathe it, which 
I think is awesome. And uh, I, I look to hopefully be back at that spot where I, I live and breathe it more. Uh, and I look up to them tremendously. So I feel like I need to raise the bar if you're actually calling me queen. You're inspiring me here, though. Yeah, absolutely. You're you're definitely up there, and I, I guess we got to sh- throw James Wanamaker in there oh, too. Oh my They're gosh! Just, right, like the OG, just because he's a little bit older. King, yes, absolutely. Yes. How yeah, yeah, yeah. How could we not? I want to go back to something that you said uh, with regard to being in dentistry and, and connecting and making those relationships. And and for me, that is what has made dentistry so rewarding, you know, making relationships and connections with patients that we serve. Mm-hmm. But above that, also connecting with different dentists across the nation. I think that for me, that's what made ASDA so powerful is that we were able to make and communicate with colleagues all over the nation. We were able to share some of our struggles that we were going through in dental school and then come together and share ideas to move the, pro- the profession forward with these ideas that we were passionate about. Mm-hmm. And for me, I, I also thought my time you know, on the board as president was um, – it was very life changing to to me. And I think that your role as Speaker of the House really influenced me as well, too. And you really helped me during that year. And it was just such a fun time uh, with everyone on the board and uh, on EC and in ESA. I just thought it was great and shaped me in a, such a unique way. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. I feel like, you know, dental school is hard. Um, and being, you know, having your peers at school is great and helpful but that's your bubble and that's all you know that is happening. And that's all your peers know for the most part too. So I feel like for ASDA, it was such a breath of fresh air for us to have the ability to see one another. And while that was our commonality, we recognized so many other things that we got along. Like, I think you guys were talking about, I think you and Rupali even talked about um, like uh, musicals or things like that musical theater. Mm -hmm. So many other things that it's like, we are, more than just our dental student lives. Um, although that is a huge part of our lives. Dentistry is, we love it. We're passionate about it, but having the opportunity to connect with people who have those like-mindedness to them are passionate, but have other things going on was great. And like you said, with our struggles to kind of not only commiserate sometimes, but have the opportunity to say, this is what's happening. What are you guys doing there? What can we do differently? Um, really finding solutions. That was tremendous. And I think now such something that I value so much is after ASDA, after dental school, you know, I have all of these connections from people all over the U S because I met them in ASDA and I'd get to Mm -hmm. see them maybe four or five times a year, but those were really connected times that we would spend with each other. And oftentimes I'll have a friend of a friend or I'll connect with this person and, oh, yeah, I know them as well. And it just makes you feel like that dental community is that much of a a tighter web in a great way. And therefore, that web is kind of support. We're still supporting each other. We're still going through this new dentist era together. Um, So that's been huge for me to not only have when I was in dental school, um, but also reflect on after the fact to know. I'm not alone as a new dentist. And this is something, you know, you're doing in an incredible way to make new dentists feel and be reminded that we have each other as well. Um, So that's, that's been huge for me too. Well, thank you for that. And this is an opportunity for new dentists to share their stories and hopefully those who are kind of coming out of school to learn from different stories and pick up different pearls that they can kind of incorporate into their lives. Or, you know, if they find a way of practicing that's different than what they're doing now, you know, maybe be inspired to do that, uh, but also help to make connections. I think that, you know, like like you mentioned, the dental community is very tight knit. And the mm-hmm. more that you get involved, the more people that you meet and they get just closer and closer. Um, so I would encourage those who are listening to get involved in organizing industry. And if you're a student and you have time in your dental school career, get involved. It's so worth it. Mm -hmm. You will grow as a leader. You will grow as a person. You'll grow as a professional. You know, I I think that that time in dental school just helps mold you in such a unique way. And as a, for me, made me a better person once I did graduate and helped me recognize the importance of advocating for the Mm -hmm. profession in order for us to to see it grow and see it better in the future. Absolutely. And I think gave us a skill set as human beings and also as leaders too. So, you know, after um, dental school, feeling like we could jump into involvement and being confident in ourselves. And that's really what many of the more seasoned dentists kind of see um, and are, and thus make them more 
comfortable to to us uh, jumping right on in. Took the words right out of my mouth. I'm a big proponent of organized dentistry. Absolutely. Abby, pivoting away from dental school, what was your life like after you graduated dental school? You did a residency. I did. I know that. Yes. How was your residency and what was that in? Yes. So I did a GPR general practice residency at the Washington, D.C. VA hospital. Uh, So it was a one year GPR. Started that, you know, July after uh, dental school had ended and then ended the following end of June. Um, I, uh, my program, my colleagues in my program, my peers are such awesome people. And we have six total residents there and all six of us, my year were girls. And there was so much flack given to the program director about why, like, how did, why did you do that? It's just going to be drama central. Like (laughs) this is going to be bad, not from the residents coming in, but pretty much from everybody else. Um, and I, I think she made a great choice with that because somehow all six of us got along incredibly well and we were each other's support system, still super, super tight. Um, and we've all kind of had different trajectories from residency, but keep up with one another. Um, so for residency, you know, similar to many things in dental school, it was, it was tough as well. There was a lot of time spent out of clinical care. Um, organizationally, just getting prepared for the day, contacting patients. Um, and there were things that my program, I, I do feel, has improved upon um, after we left. Just like with anything, you want to leave it better than than you came into it. And I think it's a solid program, but I also think there's always room for improvement. So for certain things like patient communication or even incorporating more technology, they're doing even more of that now. It was a hospital-based setting. And it was with veterans. So that part was very interesting. Um, and I, they say, if you've been to one VA, you've been to one VA. And thus far from the little bit that I've seen and with my program, I can attest to that being true. Um, you know, in some ways it was great to get a lot of complex treatment under my belt, get my speed up. Um, also see the dynamics of not really being in private practice, but how more of a dental setting works together, support staff, the whole team, um, or how it doesn't work and and what you need to do to navigate that. Um, with our, our veterans, they have been so amazing to serve our country, um, but unfortunately not all of them receive dental care. And there has to be a certain level that they essentially reach um, related to their service time. It's called service connection. Um related to injuries they may have sustained, um, medical issues related to their service that then give them this percentage level. And that is the bar, the line that they have to be above to receive dental care. There are many veterans that it does serve, but it was really difficult to be in that overall hospital setting and have to essentially turn people away. Um, Since they have served um, us in an incredible way. They do not pay directly for their care. So one interesting thing was that wasn't a conversation I was ever having with patients, um, which in a way was was great. That wasn't part of the decision-making process for them, uh, which was really key. And in many ways, that's how it should be. Mm-hmm. Um, on the other end of things, though, it, it was sometimes difficult to navigate because, you know, certain things that that didn't necessarily need to be done or maybe it could be a little bit more pressure coming from the patient. Um, it also has red tape in other ways, right? So maybe monetarily, direct monetary, not so much, but in terms of what you could get complained on a particular day or again, who was able to receive care. That was tricky to navigate. Um, also dealing with, um, personalities, different personalities, obviously a lot of patients with PTSD Mm. and navigating high anxiety. Um, I think that, you know, pretty much the whole U S we probably ride along with a higher baseline anxiety than most countries. Um, and I think that's key to know how to manage as best you can in the dental setting. Um, I worked under a fantastic prosthodontist and she truly shaped my residency experience because she allowed me, if I wanted to push, I wanted to show her I could do this wax up. She really helped me to be able to move towards more complex treatments, um, you know, whenever it was needed. 
and to kind of think outside of the box. Um, she also is an avid reader of articles and staying abreast to everything going on uh, in dentistry. So that was super helpful to me to come out uh, with. So that was residency year, great year, tough year, but again, got me back to the area as well. Uh, and I've been back to speak a couple of times to the residents and it's always a little funny to get awesome. in those halls. Um, then I started practicing. Do you want me to talk about practice? Yes. Yeah. Well, that sounds real quick. That sounds like a great residency. I got to know, are you team AGD GPR after students graduate? So I am not one size fits all. That's my answer. Very, very political answer of me, right? Of uh, course. Yes. So yes. Um, what I would say is I think if you have a fantastic mentor, an individual that is truly committed to mentoring you, you do not need a residency after the fact for doing GPR, AGD, if you're, you know, obviously specialty is a different ballgame. But I think if you have that, you're in a great setting. I think if you don't or there are particular procedures that you want to do, not every residency is the same. Talk to people who have been residents there. Get honest feedback from them to know what am I actually going to get to experience. I think, unfortunately, a lot of residencies rely on their, um, what people have heard about them, their reputation in the past, is that reputation accurate or not? I think unfortunately a lot are inaccurate and a lot get amazing dental students coming out of dental school that aren't able to then really do what they expect to do in that Mm. year. Um, again, alternatively, if you have that mentor, you're taking a big pay cut if you're doing residency. So if you're able to work in the practice setting and take other CE, not a bad opportunity. Um, it was great for me. I think I needed it. Um, and it gave me more confidence when I got out of residency to hit the ground. That's my quality. Very well said. And I completely agree with you with not all residencies are made alike. I, I do think that you really, really need to talk to the residents that are there to tell you what the true experience is. Mm-hmm. Uh, many are oversold and underdelivered, yeah. in yeah. my opinion. Uh, but there are a lot of really, really, really great ones as well, too. Uh, and if you want to get into those, they're usually probably a little bit more competitive. Mm-hmm. But yes, Abby, tell us about your transition from residency into practice and what you're doing now. Yes. So um, after residency, I started working uh, at a practice called Virginia Dental Center in Arlington and Clarendon area. So Northern Virginia, large um, practice setting, five dentists there, um, nine operatory, very busy, very insurance based. Um great place uh, overall and awesome place for me personally to start um, out as well. A lot of experience, a lot of treatment that I feel like I got, you know, figured out areas that I needed to pivot, what worked best in my hands, all those things that you want to have happen at the beginning of, of your career. And biggest thing for me is I figured out just like in residency, having those other five co residents and collaborating with them, so key for me and so key for how my brain works. When I was at BDC, similar thing, four other doctors there, any given time of the week, there are four of us total. So three other doctors that I could spitball with, talk about, look at an x-ray with. Um, I love that. I still love that. I don't know when I won't want that. Um, That's just, yeah, I like that collaborative feel to it. So that was an awesome setting. Um, I was looking for something where I could grow a little bit more and honestly, spend more time with patients. Again, as you can tell, if you're listening, I'm long-winded. Um, so I need a little bit more time with patients. Um, and I uh, actually met um, my now boss in study club. And that was such a cool experience. And I highly recommend study clubs. Um, even if you can go visit them while you're in dental school or while you're in residency to get to know people. So, so fantastic. Um, It's a bunch of people nerding out, talking about dentistry, putting in a little extra effort. So if you're like that, you're going to find people who are like you and who you probably want to work with. So um, my now boss and I, we we met there. It was great because we met during a treatment planning session. So you get an opportunity to see how someone thinks inside the box or outside the box or they're not into it or whatever. And you don't often get to do that um, with colleagues. So I think that's an awesome asset. And he and I just got to talking and it was very um, relaxed, no pressure. But he said, you know, I might be looking for an associate at some point. I I wasn't really looking at that point in time and things just continued to evolve. And then I I wasn't sure about it. You know, 
didn't want it to be grass is greener and that it'd be something that wasn't the right thing. And he and I just kept talking. And the more we talked, the more comfortable I felt with essentially his mission and already what he had going on. Um, And it was going to allow me to have more time with patients, which was key, and really take the time to do the dentistry that I wanted to do as well. Take the time to go take CE to do the dentistry that I want to do as well. Um, So I've been there um, since last March, so a little over a year now. Um, And it's been, it's flown by, but it's been an awesome year. And um, my husband and I actually moved not far from the practice. So now I'm the biking dentist, I often walk or bike to work, which is great. And I feel like for me to one thing I figured out, I love dentistry. I'm passionate about it. It's hard for me to leave work at work, but this happiness factor is huge to me. I'm not looking to make the most money out of everyone while that's important to pay off student loans. We can talk about that advocacy part later. Um, at the same time, I value my day-to-day, my interactions with staff, my interactions with patients, my ability to do what I'm comfortable with so much more. And that happiness factor with where I'm living and how I get to work and not spending, you know, two hours in the car, that kind of thing. Um, So that's played a big role in me figuring out where I want to be professionally too. I love dentistry, but I also love to leave dentistry behind. (laughs) you know, leave it at work and kind of do, do my own thing. But uh, I completely agree with you. Study clubs are a great way to make connections in your community with other dentists and also find future employers. Yeah. You know, these are people who are trying to better themselves. This is a way to for you to better yourself mm-hmm. and also meet others um, who are like-minded and want to, you know, grow in their skills. Mm-hmm. Uh, Abby, long-term, do you see yourself owning? Very good question. We'll see if my boss listens to this. <laughs> uh, I basically... I actually, I, I, I put my ma- my foot in my mouth a couple of times in my life. And one was, I said, I wasn't going to go to UNC. I said, I didn't care about pursuing dentistry. Maybe this is the third time. Um, I said, basically all through dental school, residency, probably up until last year, I don't really think I ever want to own. I don't, I don't think that's for me. I don't want to deal with the stress of it. My dad was an owner. He did a great job with it, but I saw the good, the bad, the ugly. And there's a lot of responsibility. Um, Now I'm feeling a little differently about it. I Mm. think that, you know, in the right space, I would love to, um, again, going off that collaboration, be a part owner. Um, I I enjoy and take on more of that responsibility. And it's a pride thing in some ways, but I, I find myself doing that in some regards, it's not the same in some regards anyway. Um, and, um, I, I would love to be more integral, um, with that, I think in the future. And I think also as I get older, I'll probably get more opinionated and want to have, uh, my, my opinions heard in many ways too. So it's something that deeply interests me now. Um, I have talked, uh, to, to my boss, Mark, a little bit about, maybe doing um, an online MBA or something like that as well, just to have a better handle on the financial side. My husband, Andy, that's like, he's got that on Mm -hmm. lock. I feel like I really never got a proper education in that in dental school. And unfortunately, I don't think most people do in dental school Um, or in really any part of our normal education, not, you know, in high school, even or college where I feel like I have a handle on how, you know, you're looking at different things and and these numbers and really what they mean. Um, right. So that might be something that I'm interested in doing prior to stepping into you know, part ownership role. Exciting. Well, I'm sure that, you know, any direction that you take, you're, you're going to excel. So the exciting things okay. coming your way for sure. Um, Abby, any, you know, closing thoughts that you have for our listeners? I, I hate to end it so close, but I want to be no, respectful of your yes. time and our listeners' no, time no, as well, no. too. But Absolutely. A- anything that you feel passionate about or closing thoughts that you want to share with our, our listeners here today? I would say, um, well, I think a couple of things that I've reflected on is um, you never know where life will take you. Don't put your foot in your mouth too much. Never say never. Um also with that, be open to where life is taking you. So when I didn't get into dental school, everything happens for a reason. I would have never come to this area, wouldn't have fallen in love with it, wouldn't have come into re- come to residency here. Um, all these things and, and being more involved in organized dentistry, you just don't know where life is going to take you. And it can be really awesome and beautiful. 
Um, and I also would impart on just staying very humble. Um, I think most people won't have trouble with that coming out of dental school, but you always have something to learn. And again, I think that's a great reason to go into this field because it is not stagnant. It is always changing. There's always something new to learn. And you have something to learn from peers, colleagues, patients as well. Um, so be open to that. Um, those are those are probably my my biggest pieces. The last one would be kind of in opposition to, to staying humble. When you come out of dental school and as you move into career, your career, one thing I've learned as a new dentist is the more I'm learning, the dumber I feel. Um, and it's a, it's a real, it's, it's a, it's a real thing. I think it's like called the Dunning Kruger effect or something. Um, kind of the, the less intelligence you have about something, actually you think you're better at it. So don't be surprised as, as you're moving kind of in these new dentist years that you're feeling like, oh my gosh, I don't know that. I don't know how to do that either. And that person's doing that. I see that on Instagram. Why am I not doing that? Comparison can be really difficult. I think with dental school students right now, it's especially difficult, um, obviously because of social media, but because of COVID times too, and get really good at the bread and butter dentistry and then grab on to these other um, specialty type of procedures that you want to take on, but don't feel like you have to do everything at the same time. You simply can't, um, but do what you enjoy and uh, you won't work a day in your life, as they say. That's right. As they say, yes. So very true. So very well said. There have been many times that dentistry has humbled me. And I, I love the profession that there's just so many, you know, nooks and crannies yeah. and nitty gritty details that you can continue to learn. And that's the beauty of the profession. Um, right. You just will never stop learning. For sure. Abby, if our listeners would like to connect with you, what's the best way? Yes. Um, I am on Instagram at dear doctor, dr. Abby. You know, like the dear Abby of, of old people are probably now getting too, too young for this, but it was a newspaper column there. So dear Dr. Abby is, is my Instagram handle. Or as I'd like to say, dear Drabby. Also Drabby. Abby, thank you so much for your time and for connecting with me once again. I cannot wait until uh, you and I get to see each other in person yes. and hopefully others will have the opportunity to meet you because you're just a phenomenal and amazing thank person. You. Thank you. Couldn't agree more. Thank you so much, Tanya Sue. And see you in Orlando at SmileCon. Absolutely. And we hope to see you all there. Awesome. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of New Dentists on the Block. If you'd like to connect with Dr. Abby Halpern, you can find her on Instagram at Dear Dr. Abby, or as we like to say, Dear Drabby. Please be sure to subscribe to the podcast on YouTube and all major podcast platforms. Would love if you would leave a review of this podcast episode. If you have a new dentist you would like to recommend for the podcast, be sure to send an Instagram message to at New Dentist on the Block. If you'd like to connect with me, you can find me on Instagram at tsmaestas.dds. We'll catch you next time.